Welcome to chapter four of services marketing, the chapter in which we place a great degree of emphasis on understanding whether the services that you are providing are core product, actual product or augmented product. So what we're looking at here is the idea that you can have a core service and a supplemental service. That the core service is the product on offer and the supplemental service are the service functions that support a core good or service product offer. So one of the things I just want to upfront talk about is in the textbook they mention the Tough Mudder challenge and I really think that this is a fine example of why segmentation is so important. Because most of the things that are features in this particular race, and if you look at the image on screen, there is barbed wire, there is mud, there is a whole lot of reasons not to be anywhere near that field and necessarily the people in it. And you can charge a premium for this because you've got the right audience. So it's all about knowing what it is that your audience is seeking in terms of a core product, how you can manifest that in an actual product and how you can support that with supplemental services and the supplemental uh, auxiliary augmented product. So let's talk about service products for a moment. We are wanting to distinctly define when we talk about services whether we are thinking the offering that has value, so the actual product, or whether we want to be looking at the supplemental service where it's the augmented product. Now the core product is always the value that is sought by the customer and the actual product is how we as marketers facilitate the customer getting to their core product. In the service product concept, core, supplemental and delivery. So you've got the what it is the customer wants what it is that we are providing as an actual product, how supplemental elements, which we're about to talk about as the services flower, and then the procedural and process elements of the service manifesting itself. So let's start with the supplemental services. And we're gonna see this flower recur throughout the text. Uh, Lovelock was particularly fond of this particular diagram and what it is, it's about understanding there is a product that you provide. Uh, and it's unfortunate that they chose the word core. So there's the actual product, the product as it manifests, and that can be goods or a service. And then there are the support elements around which we present a cluster of different behaviors that can enhance or even allow for the existence of that central product. So let's talk about the facilitators. In the process here, we've got information, order taking, billing and payment. And that really is the heart of the supplemental service. How does someone find out about the product? How do we meet those information we think back to consumer behavior and the diagrams on CB and how it, once problem recognition has happened, we go to search behavior. How do we provide that information so that people can access, realize that the service exists and that the service can meet their need? So how do we facilitate the information necessary from the consumer's information search, internal and external? Within the having looked at back to the CB diagram, when we do the purchase, we see a little box that says purchase to post purchase. Purchase covers the elements such as order taking, billing and payment. And these supplemental service behaviors are incredibly important because if we can't get the order, if the customer can't successfully order from us, then they are left with an unfulfilled need and a loss of satisfaction and we are met with an unresolved market that we and a missed opportunity. Similarly, billing 
If the customer can't pay, they can order but they can't pay, then we can't make the sale. Same way for payment. We've got to have means and methods by which we will accept money. Now the payment, the getting the money aspect can be incredibly broad. It can be financial and non-financial payments. It can be uh, the financial, different financial mechanisms, PayPal, Bitcoin, cash, and you know, quaint. Credit cards, bartering, barter cards. It can be non-financial. It can be donations of time. It can be donations of activities. It can, again, bring uh, barter in as a non-financial payment. There are ways and means. It's up to us, the services marketing providers, to say what is the best exchange because we're looking here for the exchange that has value for us and the exchange that is valued by the customer when we're down at payment. So let's talk about four enhancements. Again, we're talking here about the um, approach inside the supplemental services. Supplemental services that enable consultation, and this can be part of, through both order taking, but also through customization. The notion of hospitality within the service, because people are part of the service. People come to a service, looking after people within that service. Now, hospitality and safekeeping should be noted here that these will have different levels of importance depending on the type of service product. If this is a service that is acted upon a person, hospitality will take priority. If this is a service that is acted upon information or personal possessions, safekeeping will take priority. And safekeeping, it is about the preservation and safety of the items. So no matter what the uh, Hospitality Act and the Hotels Act says, when you go to a hotel, you do expect a degree of security for your hotel room. And the hospitality is the room is comfortable. The safekeeping is if you leave the room, that you can be fairly safe. It's not going to be ransacked by someone with the master key. The last aspect on here are the exceptions. And this is where the enhancement within the flower is, can we make one-off or recurring interventions that modify a current product offer to solve a specific requirement or need? Now, if we're making frequent exceptions, this is clearly evidence of the need for a new product. For example, in uh, catering and hospitality, a constant requirement for gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan and vegetarian means that rather than turning these into exceptions, these are product opportunities. So you can go and create a product that solves this outright rather than having to do one-off exceptions each time. So your exceptions area is both to enable a positive service but also can be a form of market feedback and market information to say, hey, here's an opportunity. We should cash in on that. In terms of the exceptions, again, you look at these uh, special requests in advance of service delivery of different types of needs. Again, these become opportunities based on your market segment. This can become a product category in its own right. Communications. Complaints, com compliments, and suggestions. Again, a feedback loop. This time it's an information loop. And also where you've got service failure, and we talk about service recovery later in the book, how do we handle complaints? And we're also one of the things we're not necessarily as good at is service success. Now we talk a bit about service failure and recovery from service failure, but how your firm handles service success through compliments is also a mark of your organization. And lastly, restitution and problem solving. When things go wrong, because things will always go wrong, how does the service assist the customer in recovering the customer to a previous state of things haven't gone wrong yet? And that is the warranty and the guarantee. These are refunds when it's problematic, uh, the service doesn't work or the service fails. These are 
assisting people who, through no fault of the service provider, something has gone wrong, how do we help the customer? So the service performance exceptions gets its own category here because there is a series of opportunities for new product development, uh, strength identification, weakness identification, and positioning to come out of paying attention to what happens in the exceptions category. So let's talk now a little bit on the service plan front. I uh, just want to say that one of the things to be really mindful of when you're reading this chapter is that there will still be that emphasis on new product development, new service development as a tool of growth. And remember, you may not necessarily need to grow the organization. What you may find, and what happens most commonly, is we identify within the service the emergence of a possible new product offer. Now if we take for example the previous slide where we we're talking about exceptions and the special request exceptions. Diet, medical or disability need, religious observation, those three alone give you the opportunity for a major set of service products that are positioned directly to markets who have specific needs. The offering of kosher food, halal food, is the observation of there is a market of religious individuals who require religious oriented products. This is also why it's easy to get fish on a Friday at restaurants who are serving Christian needs. So there is a market opportunity in need solution. Now it may come out that emergent from just simply operating the firm is on a regular basis on a Friday it's like that's a lot of requests for fish. Can also be met with that's a lot of opportunity to run fish specials on a Friday. Targeting into the quasi-Catholic um, and the Christian markets, fine market time uh, segmentation. There's your position. We're a religious friendly organization. We have customization fit for major denominations. So this is what you want to be thinking about is whilst you're providing a service, does a product naturally emerge? In order to create what we have on screen, the planning, creating and delivering services, again, what you're looking at is the market opportunity what sort of resource allocation to pay off, so what's your return on investment, what does it do for your market positioning. Now one of the things that the creation of halal products alongside the creation of kosher products alongside the creation of Christian oriented products, it's really frustrating I cannot remember the word for uh, the equivalent word for halal and kosher inside uh, Christianity. What does that position then do for you? What does that do in terms of distinguishing you in the eyes of target market segments? Does that create customers who want to buy from you? And does that create communities of opposition? If it creates communities of, of opposition, are these clients who you were selling to in the first place? And are these clients you wanted? Because if they're not buying from you, and you're not selling to them, and you don't want them, then them being opposed to you is a really good thing, and you should capitalize on it. And there's your market opportunity all right there. Market segmentation of, we've got these labels on our food, you're not going to buy our product, excellent. I don't have you as a customer because I don't want you as a customer. That is segmentation, targeting, and positioning. So remember, an opposition from an audience you don't want to, who you're not going to sell to and is not buying from you is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing because you are being out of line and there are areas in which, but if it's not, if you're going to just be straight mercenary on it, if someone wants you to change and they're not going to buy your product when you change and your change will alienate your audience, don't sell them that product. All right, new service development, new product development, 
go look at the chapter. Be mindful that you don't have to build, you don't have to grow. Also think back to your Ansoft matrix. Is this a new product to an audience you already have? Is this a new product to an audience you don't serve? Because diversification is harder. So you don't necessarily want to just try developing a new service for the sake of it. You want to develop a service where there is a point and a purpose to it. Okay, now we're going to get to some interesting some of the conceptual head case stuff here. Service branding. Branding is a really significantly important part of marketing. Uh, there's a lot of work been done on it recently, and we actually have uh, two or three, depending on what time of uh, semester it is, really good branding experts on deck. So if you ever get the opportunity to uh, take a subject with Dr. Egar or Dr. Hughes, you've got two of the A-game branding experts available to you. So listen to what they've got to say in this area. The services branding model has a couple of important factors that I want to draw your attention to. I want you to read the details in the book, but I want to draw your attention to one of the really important elements here, and that is service branding comes from customer experience with the company. Remembering that experience and credence products are heavily dependent by word of mouth. So if it's difficult for someone to assess a product beforehand, so it's low on search attributes, they will go to ask their friends, people who have experienced the product, they will want to talk to someone who has knowledge of the product. So that customer's experience becomes an important piece of information about what the brand is like. But also, the customer who can speak to the brand contributes their personal reputation, their personal brand, to the company's brand. So if you were to ask someone, you would ask a friend about a particular brand, you could also judge that brand in part by the fact your friends, they associate with the brand and the brand associates with them. So brand meaning is very much influenced by the interpretation of the individual. There is an element of the external communications we create as marketers, but there's also your experience and your word of mouth knowledge of the brand from your peers, from the people you talk to. So again, it's one to watch for is that there's a certain level of brand transference that comes from the audience that is attached to a brand. And we have that very, it's very prevalent in physical branding, in physical goods, because it's a lot easier to see a t-shirt, a car, a motorbike, even a drink, the sorts of person who's associated with it. But then we also have it very strongly in terms of if you can describe a typical person at a service venue. So if we start thinking about the nightclubs in Canberra, and you can start working out your market profiles in your head about who goes where, and you start thinking about locations in Canberra, and you start thinking about the service, the brand associated with the services, and the brand associated with the service providers based on the sort of audience you can expect to find in the room. Then you're getting the hang of this brand meaning and your segmentation positioning. Uh, there's a set of branding alternatives. Again, just want to bring your attention up to this. The different styles of branding approach. Uh, every time a spectrum appears, I go to great length to go and talk about the fact that a spectrum is just that. There's no good or bad. There is no right or wrong on this spectrum. There is a preference and a style, and each branding decision creates a consequence. So if you decide you want a full branded, full, you know, the branded house, everyone under the same brand, that is a consequence that flows through the decision making of all the other elements of the brand. If everyone's on their own, if every uh, part of your service chain or service element is individualized, again, a decision that has a consequence. So you want to be mindful of these things that when you decide, oh, I'm going to take a sub brand, bang. That means you've got a primary brand, you've got a sub-brand, 
and you have to then live with the consequences of that decision and put the emphasis into the way in which your sub-brand is managed and the way in which your sub-brand interacts with your primary brand. All right, second to last of the elements here, the theoretical. Uh, I want to bring your attention to service tiering because service tiering has a very strong link to market segmentation and it's a really good way to do a market segment. And this is an important thing to be considering here is we've talked about segmentation early in chapter three, but that doesn't mean you can't use latter theories to influence what you, you how you make your segment decision. So if you go back and say, all right, I'm going to segment based on service tiers. You've got first class, business class, premium class, premium economy, 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 economy. And yes, economy, economy does exist. Standby flights, super cheap, special deals. There are varieties of ways. But then what you're looking at is that for each of the classes here, this becomes a segmentation variable and it becomes a positioning variable and that you can create product offers and brand offers that build and facilitate both the segmentation. So segmentation on uh, price sensitivity means that you would charge higher prices to trigger that sensitivity. Segmentation based on brand features and product features means that you would clearly cut a block of features from one product offer and only have it available at the next tier. All of these are variables that you can use to make a segment and variables you can use for targeting, who's going to be most responsive to these elements and variables that can then inform positioning strategies. Do we want to actually go out and position ourselves as the biggest seats, the big plane with the biggest seats, or do we want to go out as the fastest or what feature matches our market in our service tiering? What do they care about? Is it in the order? Is it a product category and a service tier that is valuable? So really look over this, but think, be thinking about not just how do I make a product, but how do I use this tier to divide my audience into a way that those audience members will be responsive to this offer. All right, the mini case. Now I'm raising the mini case here because the Hong Kong Airport Express case is quite interesting. And I'd like you to, this is self-development. So this is completely voluntary. I'm not going to talk about it in the tutorials. This is about you. And this is actually a throwdown. Look, let me go John Stewart on you for a second here. I know you're busy. I know you got a busy semester. But this is going to make things easier for you, okay? If you do these mini cases, if you look at the back of the textbook, you're reading these mini cases, and you are at least just jotting down notes to the answers, that's practice for the exam. It's training for the exam. Just answer these questions by yourself. You don't, no one else needs to see them. If you want to get a few mates together and talk about what your answers were after you've all done the answers, you'll get some value out of it. But it's about self-development. It's about self-service. It's about self-creation. Now, the thing I know that some of you will be feeling is like, but what if I answer this and what if I answer it wrong? It doesn't matter. It genuinely doesn't. Because you've answered this. You don't have to answer it blind. You don't have to answer it in a closed environment. You can bring in supplemental support. You can look at these questions and say, how, how can I use these readings I've been doing? How can I use the chapter, the stuff I've read in this chapter? You know, where's my Lovelock citation going to go in my answers to these questions? So this is about you working by yourself or with a small group of self-selected friends to enhance your own education experience. You don't have to, completely voluntary, but it'll just, it'll make the semester so much easier for you. I really like you to do it. All right, 
in the post follow up. Read the book chapter. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff in this chapter. It's very. The slide deck this time is all about some high points I want to talk to, but the guts, the bulk, and the uh, the priority is reading the chapter. So get in there, have a look at the chapter. You've got a couple of challenges, thinking challenges for you. I'd like you to think about that case study, that uh, Hong Kong Express. How does the flower of service fit in there? How does the flower of service fit to the Tough Mudder case study? I'd also like you to think about, in the connecting the dots question here is, you've got the Grace and Cass paper to read this week, in this attached to this chapter. Read that through and try and fit that paper to the two case examples, to the Tough Mudder and the Hong Kong Express. Really push yourself. Like, this is chapter four. This is one where there's a lot of cognitive uh, opportunity. There's a lot of chances to go and say, this is how it works in the real world. This is how the practical applications. It's a test and training run. Use the two cases, train on those two cases. Practice with those two cases. So you're familiar with the technique that will come in handy because you're going to need to apply these. I also want you to think about now in your overall assessment tasks, your overall case study tasks, look at how these elements will fit to the case that you're working on. So two intra-chapter case questions, the Tough Mudder and the uh, Hong Kong Airport Express. Do a dry run, do a practice run, use these theories, test them out, talk to your mates, get together, use the forum on Waddle. Then go look at your assessment question of your case assessment, your first assignment. Say, how do these ideas fit the question that I've been asked to address? So connect the dots on those ones. As always, if you need me, connect to me across the platforms. Always happy for you to come and see me, make a meeting time, come and have a chat. And so this is one where we're starting to really push into this co-production, co-creation of your education here. Start experiencing the service. Start experiencing the processes of the thinking and the theoretical frameworks. So should be good. And please just... Don't forget self-service technology. The book is one of the premium self-service technologies you've got. Give it a read. Give it an application. See how it goes.